Thank you again, Jenny, for all your technical support and Betsy too. Hello, I wanna welcome everyone to our poster sessions. I'm really excited to introduce our presenters. We have four amazing posters to talk about today. Each, uh, each presenter will have about eight to 10 minutes and then we'll do, of course, questions towards the, at the end. Uh, the first one will be Amy Romiller from the University of Dayton, The Games of Foot, Introducing Students to Archival Resources. And then Sarah Azenbray and Michelle Bodine, who Michelle didn't get make it with us today, but Throwback Thursday reinvented a communications and archives collaboration. They're from the Sisters of the Precious Blood. Then Suzanne Reller, who is at the University of Cincinnati, traditional description and untraditional instruction in the archives. And then we'll finish up with Kim Hoffman and Rachel Makarasi from Miami University with preserving our co connections crafting instruction opportunities from serendipitous encounters. I turn it over to the presenters. Hi everybody, thank you so much for coming to the poster session today um, and especially doing it over your lunch hour. Um, I'm going to share my screen and hopefully that worked, yep. And you can all see my poster. Uh, I am going yes. to talk about how we in the University Archives and Special Collections at the University of Dayton um, have started gamifying some of our programs and then the impacts that that has had on us. We are really lucky um, at UD that our library programs are all a part of um, it's called Aviate here, but it's the residential curriculum um, and students are forced to attend if they want a housing point, which will help them get better housing in the future um, for the next year. So we never have an attendance problem, um, but we decided to start incorporating some games into our programming um, as a way to increase student engagement uh, with the programs and our collections. Um, and because gamifying is a great way to appeal to a variety of learning styles, um, we were giving them the opportunity to really get hands on and interact with our learning objectives, with the collections, and with us. And hopefully by doing that, um, by presenting the information, often in more than one way, um, then it would stick. I mentioned that um, all of these programs are part of our residential learning curriculum. I don't want to go too much into them, uh, especially if you were in the session presented by some of my colleagues yesterday. I know they talked a lot about ABA and gave some statistics to it. Um, but the takeaway is that it, the programs have to tie in with one of the residential curriculum learning goals. Um, and then probably most importantly for us, the programs are also required to include a hands-on element of some kind. And then the collections that we have highlighted through our games um, have been really diverse and varied, which is great. Um, we've been able to incorporate everything from um, university records, departmental records, to our photograph collection. We have a memorabilia collection. Um, we have a variety of student publications. Uh, and we've really been able to show off the strengths of our special collections. We have some significant sports history collections um, some congressional papers, and some really great journalism collections, which if you were able to attend our highlights tour yesterday, you have been introduced to some of them. And wow, I am just plugging everything at this conference, I guess. <laughs> um, the first game that I want to highlight uh, is our University History Scavenger Hunt. Um, and this was actually our first venture into a purely online program. Um, it debuted in fall 2020, uh, right when the students were coming back to campus and right when uh, campus was actually going back into kind of a, a modified lockdown because there was a big COVID outbreak among the undergraduate students. Um, so this was a way that we wanted to give them something to do uh, while they were in their dorm rooms um, and hopefully have some fun. The game mechanism was that they had to unlock those locks you see by correctly answering university history questions. Uh, and our goal with this one was to familiarize students with university history, some things that they pass every day and may not think that much about um, 
as well as introduce them to us and the collections that we had available digitally through our institutional repository, because we knew in the fall at least that um, at least for the first six weeks, classes were going to be all online um, and we were open by appointment only. So we really wanted to familiarize them uh, with how they could use university archives without um, necessarily having to do so in person. Um, it, the tools we used were pretty simple. We used the Google form. Um, I found this really great online website called flippity.net um, that not only has this scavenger hunt template, but a variety of online game templates of all different kinds. Um, you can make a Jeopardy-like game. You can do matching. There's a board game generator. Um, if you can think of something that could be interactive online, flippity.net has it, and it's really great. It's really easy to use. You fill out a Google Sheet and press a button, um, and then Flippity generates your game. And then the resources that we used from the collections were our website and our digital collections. Um, the next one, what's in special collections, was our first venture into gamifying. Uh, this one is really, really simple. We gave the students a bunch of pictures um, and had them sort it into which special collection um, that it belongs. So University Archives is one of three special collections on UD's campus. So we did this one in collaboration with the other two, the US Catholic Special Collection and the Marion Library. Um, and we actually did this one as part of student orientation um, in fall 2019 as part of uh, the program that we call Rochella uh, that introduces all new students to the library as a whole. All the students had to do, like I said, was just sort, sort images that we gave them and a quick definition of what each special collection was um, into the collection that it belonged in. We did this one physically because we could be in person at that point. So we had two magnetized versions um, and a laminated set that we did on a table. Um, but this is one of those ones that would be really easy to move online with Flippity, um, and I'm sure there are other matching game templates out there. And all we needed for this one was just images of our collection items, which we have a ton of on hand already. And then the last one is our fantasy baseball draft, which was part of our um, diversity in baseball program, which I know if, again, if you were in that session yesterday, um, that my coworker, Christina, talked about how we used our collections to introduce students um, to how diversity and specifically diversity in baseball makes things better. Um, and this was one of the activities that we used to do that. We are really lucky and have um, a significant collection of baseball cards um, that covers basically every player from the 1890s uh, up through about the 1960s or so. Uh, and so we compiled all of our baseball cards uh, and used the baseball reference website, which is like the encyclopedia or Bible of baseball stats um, to create a draft packet. Um, and then the students were divided into teams and they were to use their draft packet uh, to collaboratively uh, draft the best team they could while competing against all the other uh, teams in the room for who would get the best team. Um, and the trick was that the the more diverse your team ended up being, um, really and truly the higher your team's score ended up being, which was really an easy way to, to drive home um, the positive impact that integrating baseball had on the game um, and on society. So the impact that this has had, um, probably one of the biggest ones I think has been increased awareness um, of us and of the institutional repository. You can see the graphs there on the right show that um, interest in the institutional repository at least spiked over the month that we were running the scavenger hunt program. Um, those big peaks of downloads are when we were sending them to the institutional repository and they had to look at flyer news um, and the yearbook. So they were following the hints that we provided and they were getting some exposure to our digital collections and the institutional repository. Um, about a thousand students did the scavenger hunt. Most students in the entering class in 2019, I think, ended up uh, playing what's in special collections. 
So we know that they have at least heard of us. Um, and it has come back in some of our instruction sessions that we've done that uh, my favorite anecdote is I was doing a consultation with a student for a research paper and he was just talking about how he did this scavenger hunt aviate thing and he was flipping through the yearbook and he stumbled on this topic that wasn't even one that we had asked him about on the scavenger hunt. It was just something he had seen in one of the yearbooks that sparked his interest. Um, so we increased awareness of us and we helped him with a paper topic, which was awesome. Uh, and we really helped also increase the awareness of things on campus and of university history. Um, most buildings here, like they are most places, are named after prominent people in the university. Um, and we really tried to highlight some of that. Probably one of my other favorite comments was our soccer field is named Bojan Field. Uh, it's named after the legendary football coach, Harry Bojan, who also at one point was involved in running the KKK off of campus in the 1920s with his football team. And that was a question on the scavenger hunt. Um, and at the end, we asked them what they liked and what they learned. And the, the best response ever was that they learned that Harry Bojan was a cool ass dude. And no wonder we named the field after him. It was great. Uh, and then the students also took things and have requested similar history programs that they really want to know more about the buildings. Um, so we have things like that in development. So our lessons learned um, is that games are really, really popular. Um, on our end, we learned that keeping it as simple as possible is better for everybody. Um, the scavenger hunt seems like a really simple mechanism. Um, but everybody enjoyed it and it had to be easy enough for me to do and to manage on the back end. The fantasy baseball draft was a ton of time and complication on my end up front. Um, it was totally worth it, but if there was a way to simplify the preparation that went into it, that would be ideal. Um, all of these involved some kind of time investment up front, but the good thing is that once they've created, they've been created, um, they're really easy to adapt. You can just adapt your template or adapt your images um, to any number of different scenarios. Uh, I feel like this is a common theme. Free templates abound out there. You never really have to reinvent the wheel for anything. Um, I stumbled upon Flippity because I knew that somebody had to have had this idea somewhere ahead of me. Um, and lo and behold, they did. So uh, yeah, just never reinvent the wheel. Um, and then like I touched on with the time investment up front, like now that we've created them, um, we can adapt them for multiple uses. The scavenger hunt especially was then adapted into another orientation program for transfer students in um, the spring semester that just finished. Uh, we can adapt our sort game to all kinds of different applications. Um, the baseball draft has actually been used in a sports and literature class. Uh, so we're, we aren't limited to how we deploy these. So that's it. I'm happy to answer any questions, um, but I will pass it over to Sarah. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Sarah Eisenbray. I'm the archivist for the Sisters of the Precious Blood in Dayton, Ohio. Um, and as Bill said, um, our communications coordinator, Michelle, um, she was supposed to be with me today, but unfortunately she had a family emergency last minute. So I'm going to be presenting for both of us. <laughs> um, so please be patient with me. Um, I'm going to kind of intermingle what both of us were going to say. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Okay. Can everyone see this okay? Yes. Okay. Great. Thanks, Bill. Okay. So this is Throwback Thursday Reinvented, a communications and archives collaboration. So what Michelle and I have worked on um, since 2019 is creating um, Throwback Thursday posts. So you've seen those, I'm sure, <laughs> on many archives uh, Facebook pages. Um, but we wanted to do something a little bit different. So this poster gives an example 
of how we do Throwback Thursday posts and also something new that we decided to implement um, early and late in 2019. Um, so we do Throwback Thursday posts every week. Um, we originally were doing them every other week, but because of how popular they are on the Sisters of the F Precious Blood Facebook page, we did decide to do them um, every week. So the process for this first is I choose the photos and send them to Michelle. Um, so I choose photos based on um, a few different criteria. Um, most of the time it's popularity based on how other Throwback Thursday posts have done. Um, so the photo that you're looking at in step one, that's a photo of a sister at Regina High School in Norwood, so around Cincinnati area in Ohio, um, and she is teaching home economics. Um, and so the Regina High School posts are very, very popular. There's a really large alumni contingent from there. Um, so what Michelle does is she will reduce the size and resolution of the original photo and watermark it with our logo. Um, and this is something that helps to prevent any type of lifting the photo from the website. So even if you did try to blow it up larger, um, you wouldn't get a very good resolution. And then she saves the photos as a JPEG with underscore FB at the end of the file name, just so that we know that this photo is going onto Facebook. Now, the next thing that we do is step two, we add text and hashtags and post it on the Sisters of the Precious Bloods Facebook page. Um, and so you can see that the caption um, is there with hashtag TBT and hashtag Regina HS. We made that hashtag just based on um, the ease of it. <laughs> um, we thought that it was pretty self-explanatory. Um, now, because posts like this one are, like I said, very popular, we decided to make some groups. Um, so for Regina, we have a Regina High School alumni group. And you can see that this is a private group. Um, so we did this because we wanted alumni to feel secure and safe with um, touching base with each other, talking about their memories um, in a space where they may not be able to get to do that anywhere else. Um, so we have the Regina High School alumni group. We also have um, a group for San Luis Rey, which is in California, one for Our Lady of Good Counsel, which was in Cleveland, and then our newest group um, is Fatima High School, which was in Dayton, Ohio. Um, and so these groups all have, Regina has the highest with 226 members. I think it's gone up since we made this poster, um, but we do have up to 90, 50 to 90 in the other groups. Um, and so what we do is when we post a Throwback Thursday post that um, is in the same category as the group, so with this one, Regina High School, we share the post from the Sisters Facebook page, the Regina High School alumni group page created by us. Um, and so you'll see that the banner photo is also an archival photo. And then um, the color of the banner here, um, we also try to make that the school colors when possible. So some of them have, some of them are red, some are white, um, just to kind of give it that feel. Now, we chose these groups um, based on several factors. One of them is popularity. So um, if the Facebook posts from Regina High School were getting really high, um, likes and engagement, then we decided to make that into a group. Um, so the Cleveland group um, has the fewest members, but we did see that people were really enjoying the Facebook posts from Cleveland. So we decided to make it into a private group. Um, and we found that these groups also get really high um, engagement as well. Um, and several of these groups have met for physical reunions in the past. So we knew that there was interest in having um, a more dedicated space for them to talk and meet. Um, and then a lot of sisters are on Facebook, believe it or not. Um, and so a lot of them are also members of these groups. So they're able to talk with their former students or with other sisters um, and increase the engagement there. 
Um, and we advertise these groups on the Facebook page. We also have a Twitter. Um, we don't get as much engagement from the Twitter as we do from Facebook. So we really focus um, on the Facebook page. Now, the last step here is that Michelle will check the stats in publishing tools or business suite of the sister's Facebook page. So you can see here, this is a screenshot of um, from publishing tools. Um, Michelle said that they are getting rid of publishing tools soon and they want you to use business suite. So some of your um, stats may look different from what we have here, but that's just because Facebook is kind of in a transition phase. Um, so you can see that we capture the engagement and then this is how we decide um, what new posts to use for Throwback Thursday and also what new groups um, to make. And um, yeah, so we've seen really good engagement from this and we think that the groups are something that we're going to keep expanding upon. Um, and it's something that we think has expanded the relationship between archives and communications as well. So with that, I will stop sharing my screen and hand it over to Suzanne. You're muted, Suzanne. Thanks, Phil. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. I'm Suzanne Roller, and I am um, the Reference and Collections Librarian at the University of Cincinnati. And I'm going to go ahead and share my poster. Yeah. And Bill, can everyone see that okay? Yes. Okay, great. Um, I'd like to start my presentation with a land acknowledgement. The Cincinnati area and the land that the University of Cincinnati has been built on is a native homeland of the indigenous Algonquin speaking tribes, including the Delaware, Miami, and Shawnee tribes. My poster is titled Traditional Description and Untraditional Instruction in the Archives. It's based on a research project that I started after experiencing frustration and trying to teach students and other researchers to use finding aids. And I know many of you have probably experienced similar frustrations. I'm gonna zoom in here. The, um, the terminology used in finding aids, as we know, is unique and research in the archives is inherently different from other library research. And it's much more time consuming. These problems are not new. And I know that there are a lot of archivists out there seeking solutions to issues with finding aids, everything from addressing racist and out offensive language to addressing difficulties in searching. But we all know also that making changes to our description takes time and staff that we don't always have. So I started thinking that, um, then maybe I need to look at the ways that I was teaching students to use finding aids. My background as an archivist was focused on description. So I knew that there are probably better methods out there than the in-class demonstrations I was doing. Um, my instruction, as I said, was usually limited to an in-person demonstration. Our, our our institution does have one video on using special collections, but it's already a few years old. And it's more of an overview of all of our, um, our, our special collections and um, two repositories. So I decided I wanted to see what other archivists out there were doing, see uh, what I could be doing better. And I also wanted to start looking uh, from the viewpoint of a researcher coming to an archives website without any previous instruction sessions. So I used the ARL membership list since we're an ARL library. And I used that as a starting point and searched websites um, of those ARL libraries for guides, tutorials, and video instructions on using finding aids. To make things easier to compare, I reduced the list to the ARL libraries that were in the United States and that were also part of an academic institution. 
Uh, I also excluded my own institution since I knew what we were doing. This reduced the list to 100 repositories. So of those 100 institutions, I was unable to find any kind of guides, tutorials, or instructions on searching finding aids on 59 of the websites. Now, I'm not an expert on all the institutions or um, all the websites, so I'm sure I missed things. Um, and many sites did have some information on their instructional services that they offered to courses and groups, but um, just no specific information on searching finding aids on their website. 41 of the websites did offer some sort of online help for using finding aids. Of those 12 institutions had a simple FAQ or help page. 17 had an online guide like a LibGuide or a campus guide for searching finding aids. Four websites had an interactive tutorial and three institutions had multiple forms of instruction such as uh, both a LibGuide and a video, something like that. So as you can see from the chart down here, it seemed like the most had uh, campus guides or LibGuides. So um, to fill in any missing pieces in my research, I've started, um, to contact archivists who have some instructional information on their websites um, to have more in-depth in conversations with them. So far, I've conducted seven email or online discussions with archivists who have some sort of, like I said, finding an instruction online to see what they feel is working and what isn't. Some common themes so far include um, that videos, not surprisingly, are very time intensive to produce. Um, many have said they spent eight to 10 hours working on their videos, and especially if they were doing the editing of the videos themselves. Another common theme was that archivists have not been doing a lot of assessment, um, both of their online tutorials and videos or of their instructional programs as a whole. And finally, um, still very, it's still very common for archivists to do an in-person demonstration or online via Zoom demonstration of their finding aid or of searching their finding aid. Um, but some archivists are starting to pull in some unique activities. Um, one activity was referenced in one of my references below using primary sources. Um, this first one down here, hands-on instructional ex exercises that has some ideas for um, some instructional exercises using um, fighting aids. So um, my references here at the bottom only skim the surface of what's out there, both on the problems of finding aids and what archivists are doing in terms of instruction, but um, felt like it was enough for, for one short poster presentation. So. Um, I look forward to hearing your questions and um, comments, and I'm gonna pass it on over to Kim and Rachel. Hello, thank you for joining us. Rachel and I will be talking about uh, our preserving the connect our connections, crafting instruction opportunities from serendipitous encounters which describes what we did with an unusual request from a student and how we turn that into ongoing outreach. Before we get started, I want to read our land acknowledgement. Miami University is located within the traditional homelands of the Miamia and Shawnee people, who, along with other indigenous groups, ceded these lands to the United States in the first Treaty of Greenville in 1795. The Miami people, whose name our university carries, were forcibly removed from these homelands in 1846. We would like to pay our respects to their past, present, and future elders. 
So this situation started in March of 2020, a little bit before the COVID-19 pandemic really got started. Uh, an undergraduate student reached out to us and described a collection that we weren't aware of before belonging to the English department of over 100 books. He felt that they were significant. Um, some of them were had very interesting bindings, but they also had a lot of damage and an unknown history. The student was hoping to enlist our help in hopefully preserving the collection and also learning more about it in advance of a planned building renovation. However, the difficulty was because the collection didn't belong to the libraries, we were unsure about how much assistance we could really offer, particularly in the form of hands-on assistance or anything that would require supplies. So we faced a little bit of a tricky situation and some ethical questions there. So the first thing we did was try to understand um, the different groups involved and evaluate their expectations and their, their interest in this project and compare that to what our goals would be if we were to get involved. Uh, so the student had an interest in the project himself. He was just very enthusiastic, but he also represented an honors English club of other students who were looking for ways to get more involved and also um, were looking to learn more about the books. The English department was also involved and we weren't at first sure really what their interest was. And of course, our department and the libraries had their own interest. One of the ways that we established to navigate those different expectations was uh, a reading room catalog that they had previously created, which we used as sort of a central location to communicate with each other. So for ourselves, we realized that our goals um, were one, to improve the situation for the books because that was a big priority of the student and uh, again, of the department. And we wanted to be able to help them with that if possible. We thought that perhaps it might be more achievable for us to do that through providing advice rather than uh, hands-on assistance. But we also did want to explore whether they were ways that we could offer either some minor preservation treatment or um, even training using outreach as the way to bring that in line with our own professional obligations. We also were very interested in engaging the club members. We had not previously had contact with this particular um, English department honors club, but they were really enthusiastic and interested, and we felt like this was a great opportunity to build a relationship with them. So as part of that, we wanted to learn what are their interests? Um, what would they more interested in learning about some of the hands-on preservation treatments that we potentially would offer? Or were they more interested in collecting? Or was there kind of a mixture there? And how could we help them explore those interests? And our end goal, we realized, and sort of one of our biggest priorities was to really make sure that we could create a continuing partnership with that group. So as we were considering all of this and sort of learning about uh, the situation, we were able to establish our ideal outcomes. Um, so this was before the pandemic really got going. And what we were thinking we would do was offer an in-person hands-on workshop that would focus on evaluation, appraisal, book collecting and provenance, and some preservation tips. But we did also consider other possibilities, other situations that might have met our needs, including something a little bit more focused on, say, building phase boxes for their books, um, something more like a history of the book seminar or workshop, a book binding or bind along demonstration, uh, perhaps a roundtable discussion, or more of a preservation one-on-one -on -one, one -on -one session. When we consider all of these, we looked at whether any possible solution 
would tie in directly to their collection and honor and consider their specific concerns. But of course, COVID did actually happen. So right around when we were um, arranging to meet with the student and the English department regarding these collections and to take a good close look at them so that we could start planning this in-person hands-on workshop, the university announced that it was going to be shutting down all in-person classes, moving instruction online, and sending students home. So we knew that we were not going to be able to engage with that ideal um, solution of a hands-on workshop. So we ended up having to take a pause for a few months as we as staff ended up having to adjust to the remote work that we were ordered to begin a couple of weeks after that. Um, and then when we returned, we got back in contact with the student to ask you know, if he was still interested and his group was still interested in maybe us collaborating with them on providing an instructional type outreach event where we could be able to have a platform to discuss what it is that we wanted. Um, well, that actually really that we both wanted um, because we wanted to make sure that their books were okay as did they and they really wanted to learn as much as we wanted to teach. So we asked him a few different questions about what the club was primarily interested in, if they were still interested in an online event rather than an in-person. And we also made sure that when we were able to arrange a chance for us to get to see the book collections in person, that we could use that reading room catalog that the English department had made for these books as our touch point where we could make notes on things that we wanted to incorporate into our final session. All of this work ended up leading to, in November of 2020, um, a virtual roundtable discussion that we had chosen based on its more informal uh, instructional nature, um, where they could ask us questions as we went along, as well as at the end. Um, that really focused on, for the rare book side of things, kind of a preliminary evaluation of their condition, um, their value, and kind of just the basics of how to start looking at how much a book could be priced at to see whether or not they wanted to prioritize it for any preservation efforts that they were going to pursue. And then on the preservation side, we covered things like environmental conditions, dry cleaning methods, storage, handling, as well as preliminary box making instructions in case they wanted to try on their own. The event was quite successful. We had a good number of students actually turn up for that virtual event and they definitely were interested in pursuing this more. However, the student who served as our main point of contact has since graduated. So our next steps are going to be reestablishing um, that relationship with the club once we're all back in person this fall so that we can hopefully get that more hands-on event going. Um, and we really look forward to kind of exploring what other collaborations we could have with them um, so that we can continue to teach them with our collections, but also hopefully learn from them as well. Thank you so much for coming to our presentation. And I suppose, Bill, is it time for questions? Yes, it's time for questions. So drop them in the Q&A or in the chat. And I'll start by asking Amy, uh, with the gaming, was it a lot of uh, digital collections or did you actually do a lot of hands-on? And, and with that hands-on, did you talk about handling and care and all that kind of stuff? Um, it was a combination of... Um, the scavenger hunt was all digital collections, so there wasn't any actual collections handling. Um, and the same with the what's in special collections, the sort game, it was just images of collections pieces. It wasn't actually collections. Um, and then the baseball cards were digital scanned too. Um, so they weren't actually handling uh, the real thing at any point. Um, 
but yeah, if, if we were having them use originals, we probably would include some basic handling instructions um, because, uh, I mean, you need to protect your objects and um, they tended to get really rowdy, um, especially in the drafting their baseball teams that um, I think without handling, if we handling instructions, if we had used the real things, um, there might have been some unintentional um, handling damage. And I may have missed this. They came in the special collections into the archives, or that you, or you went into the to the, the housing. Uh, they come to us. Okay, so you had over a thousand people come in. The or... the scavenger hunt was online. Um, oh, so, okay. So they right. did. They didn't come into that um, for okay. the the sort game. They did all come in. All the the freshmen come in as part of orientation. So they come in and kind of rotate through the library building. So we were only getting. 50 or so at a time. <laughs> um, but we did see all of them in person for that one. And then the, the baseball one tapped out at 36. I think we limited seating to on that one. Seemed like it was quite popular, I can believe. So, uh, Sarah, it sounded like that, that you started with a local project because you said it went to, there's a group in California, so it kind of went nationwide. And, and you mentioned these sites, what kind of comments, what kind of feedback did you get from people uh, on these sites and that kind of stuff? Did you say that one was the largest one was what, 216 people, something like that? Yeah, so um, yeah, we did um, do Ohio sites and then the one in California. Um, and we have gotten really good feedback on the posts, um, especially within the groups. There's funny stories about we post something and then um, the people will say, oh, I remember this sister, or oh, I remember this class, or oh, I didn't like her. <laughs> um, so there are, um, so we are getting some really good memories from alums that I don't, don't think that we would get um, without this type of engagement. Um, so that's been, that's been a really fun experience to see um, the people engaging with the pictures on a more private platform where they can really engage with um, their fellow alums. That's great. So did, did it help in identifying any unidentified people or, there, or were all the, the individuals in all these photographs identified? Or... Um, so all the sisters are identified, but a lot of times we'll get people identify the students. Um, so they'll say, you know, oh, this is my great aunt in this picture, or, you know, I um, went there at this time and I'm not in this picture, why not? And then someone will say, oh, you were sick that day. <laughs> so we're getting um, some good feedback about not only the sisters, but also the other individuals that are in the pictures. I'm not sure if you saw the comment in the chat, if you wanted to respond to that. If any, all of you, it was, it was uh, my experience with TBT was that pictures of groups of people, especially alumni still living, got more traffic on Facebook, pictures of old campus scenery or buildings from 70 years ago had less response. Um, yeah, that's been true for us too. Um, and we have a very specific, um, as I'm sure most people do that do Throwback Thursday, we have specific photos that we can share based on copyright and age and those types of things. Um, but within those parameters, I always try to pick photos with people um, as much as possible, especially um, each photo usually has a sister in it. Within the groups, sometimes we'll show photos of the buildings and then people say, oh, I remember that building. I remember um, go, going through that threshold every day and those types of things. But on the main Facebook page, um, yeah, I do agree that people are usually more popular than the buildings or scenery. Thanks. Uh, Suzanne, I, what uh, archival tool do you use to process? I've kind of got kind of like a three part. Are, are your finding aids built into the IMLS? So in other words, that when patrons search, the finding aid comes up in the library catalog, or do they have to search a separate site? Does that make sense? Yes. Um, so we do have some finding aids um, linked from our catalog records, um, but we also use archive space. Um, so uh, 
And of course, there is um, people have had trouble searching with archive space um, before. But yeah, we've had uh, we do have some in archive space. We also have finding aids that are still in the old Ohio Link EAD system. So we have them in three places right now. So that makes a challenge too and teaching people how to use them. Um, so yeah, that's, that's what we have with that. Did you have another part of your question, Bill? Well, that, that was kind of when, you know, what system do you use in a sense? And it actually, it, it ties in the tutorials because it, I, I mean, it is teaching, even teaching faculty members when they want to use them. You know, not just not just students, but the tutorials get old. But I mean, how about the fall of the fine? Because uh, different systems are so different. But what did you find? You said you found the tutorials weren't that helpful, or they just got archaic in the sense of. Um, I I found them helpful. Um, one of the complaints that other archivists have said that, um, especially with the videos, things go out of date faster than they can keep up with um, doing a new video since it takes so much time. So that was one of the issues that they had expressed about that. Yeah. So and another thing about finding aids, which I'm sure another a lot of you also have, are things that are still just in paper format too. Um, how do we teach all the different areas of finding aids? Agreed, agreed. Rachel and Kim, with this, you call this an English library. I'm curious if you come across any other type of libraries hidden on the campus that aren't part of the library systems or collections? This is the only one that I have encountered. So I don't know, I don't know that it's fair to describe it as a library per se, but it was a private collection or private to the English department that was housed in a conference room in their building. So it seems like it was uh, an object of um, conversation and possibly research uh, for the English department themselves over time. But it just, I don't know if maybe the professors had so, slowly been growing it. Some of the books had apparently been there for many decades. Yeah, I, I recall a little bit from some of the background provenance stuff that I was digging into just in case students were interested in exploring that because we did kind of as we were looking through that reading room catalog be like well we can choose the own choose their own adventure towards the end and just see which of these four other topics including provenance students were interested in exploring um, so as I was digging through the provenance some of it was just from Miami alumni and professors who had they didn't donate their book to the library, instead they donated it to the English department. So the department was just slowly accumulating that. And I'm sure that there are other departments on campus that have their own libraries that aren't a part of the library system. Um, but it gets very territorial in some ways because the English department, when they contacted us, were very clear that this was not that they were looking to donate the collection to the libraries. Um, they were very intent on keeping it their own. They just wanted our guidance. Um, so I think that there's a lot of room for partnerships moving forward where we can continue to provide these types of like kind of advisory type services without taking on the responsibility of the collection. Um, and the fact that the student group was super interested in getting involved with that was added for a really rich dynamic. Um, between us and the student club. And there was no discussion of donating all these books. Oh, no. Okay. Okay. That's great. Okay, we have a question for Kim and Rachel. Did you bring in examples from the rare book collections for the round table or other discussion alongside the English department's books? And for everyone, where, were there any collection items that you've been able to highlight that didn't fit in traditional instruction in tours before, or were especially accessible for finding aid instruction. Got that? I can repeat. Yeah, we, we can take the first part of this question while everyone thinks about their answer for um, the second question. We did choose some examples from the rare book collections, but at the time that we were doing it, 
we were still mostly remote. So we had a few things that we had taken pictures of while we were in person um, to kind of supplement the pictures that we had taken when looking at the English department books, um, just for the, the comparative aspect, as well as the, if I was looking at this book, for instance, this is what I would say is an example of this because there was an example of it in the English department collection, but it still seemed relevant when talking to them about, you know, condition assessment, collecting, and other things. Um, if we were in person, we definitely would have tried to bring some of the physical objects from special collections um, into, say, our main classroom area and asked them to bring their own books that they wanted to bring from that English department collection um, so that they could do the hands-on work with that and we could use ours as like a model. Excellent. Did you recall that they had an interest in, um, as, as we mentioned a bit, uh, improving the environment for their books and also potentially learning to build phase boxes? And so I did show them some tools and examples of phase boxes from my own collection because I was at home, um, but also because, you know, they were interested in maybe some simpler options than what we would normally employ in special collections. Excellent, thank you. Now, if one get the, the, the second part of the question, I can reread or were there any collections items that you've been able to highlight that didn't fit in traditional instruction and tours and that didn't fit in tr traditional instruction tours before or were especially accessible for finding aid instruction? And anybody can jump in. I know that my answer for this is yes, I definitely have. It's just in a different context um, from the poster, uh, which I think is where I'm sticking a little bit in my answer to this question. But there definitely have been collection items that I've been able to bring into the classroom um, for just general instruction. Uh, we actually teach a course every semester for the Institute of Learning and Retirement here on campus. So that tends to be my, my avenue for getting to bring in things and talk about different aspects of the physical book that I wouldn't normally get to explore with the undergraduate students. Um, I think for us, a big thing has been, um, especially during the pandemic when we couldn't have um, researchers and that type of thing is being able to digitize a lot of the larger materials. So um, maps and we have some yearbooks with some um, some leaves that fold out and that type of thing. Um, so being able to digitize those and then share those either on Facebook or with researchers, um, that's been a huge thing um, for us, especially when people can't physically come in. And I can't think of any specific collections that have been good for, um, in my case, for finding aid instruction, but I did, um, talking to other archivists, get some great ideas. Um, uh, one was um, bringing in an entire collection to, in the boxes to get the, uh, the students to have a sense of the size of an archival collection and how it's organized. Um, and then there were some other ideas um, in that using my primary sources and my references um, of having students go um, do sort of a backwards, sort of a flipped look for a finding aid, give them a document and have them find it in the finding aid. Were some really great examples that I haven't had an opportunity to try yet, but I'm looking forward to trying those. I think for us, um, highlighting the, the digital collections that we have um, in the institutional repository was something that I don't know if we'd really been able to do before, um, especially we sent them to a lot of different parts that weren't necessarily um, like just university archives, like we sent them to university um, news releases, and then a couple 
um, questions linked to faculty scholarship that was uploaded. So um, that Harry Bojan story <laughs> I told earlier that comes from a um, some faculty research that's in there. And I don't think we would have, I don't know if we had ever um, used those parts of the institutional repository in instruction before. Excellent. We have time for another question, or if any of our speakers have questions among each other, give you the opportunity. I got smiles, that's good enough. Okay. Well, if no one has any more questions, we can end out a couple minutes early. Again, I want to thank our wonderful presenters for this, these amazing posters, and they'll be, they'll be again shared like the, the recordings of that stuff on the site. And so I want to thank the, them and any follow-up questions for them after that too. All right, and so I just want to remind everybody our next session is Pivoting for Productivity, Adapting Workflows During a Pandemic and Going Forward. Again, thanks again to our speakers and we'll see everybody in 30 minutes. <laughs>